Hi everyone, glory to Jesus Christ. It is the fifth Sunday of Great Lent, and I want to talk about St. Mary of Egypt. If you are Orthodox, you already know the life of St. Mary of Egypt. Otherwise, you probably have not heard of her. And you need to hear of her. Because this her life is is unspeakably beautiful. Do you see my Kleenex? I have my Kleenex ready because this gets to me. And St. Mary of Egypt, of course, is her life story applies to every person on the planet, but this message, bringing it into prisons, especially to female prisoners, is incredibly powerful because why are most people incarcerated? Usually drugs. How do women often pay for drugs? Prostitution. St. Mary of Egypt was a prostitute. Let's talk about that. So St. Mary of Egypt was incredibly, abnormally beautiful. She lived in the 6th century, by the way. Abnormal beauty. Just, I mean, head-turner, right? And she liked men. She's called a prostitute, because that's how she referred to herself. But she didn't actually make money that way. She made money by begging in the streets, but her pastime was men. And after living this kind of profligate lifestyle for many years, she decided to catch a boat to Jerusalem, and she was going to go see all of the, the men that were on pilgrimage there because it was a feast of the Holy Cross and they had uh, all or part, I'm not sure, of the true cross, of the cross of Christ in this church in Jerusalem. And she, she thought, look, there's going to be thousands of people that are going in there. I'm going to get lucky. So she got on the boat. Of course, I'm sure she wreaked havoc on the boat too. Got off and tried to go into the church. Okay. Couldn't do it. It was like there was some kind of invisible force field or something. Everyone else around her was going in. She couldn't physically do it. So she was like, oh my goodness, what is this? So she tried it again. Didn't work. Tried it a third time and still no go. So then she looked over and by this point she was, she had tears streaming down her face. She was scared, but she was also very, very touched because she understood at that point that there was a reality that she could not see and that that reality was not letting her go in the church. So she goes over to this icon of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, which was on the porch of the church. So evidently she was allowed to be on the porch, but she couldn't actually go into the, uh, you know, the body of the church. Okay. So she goes over to the icon of the Virgin and with tears in her eyes, she says, if you're really up there, What's going on? Why can't I go in the church? And can you please allow me to go in the church? So, of course, the virgin answered her. In her heart. Said, that's right. I'm not letting you in the church because I know exactly what your deal is. You're going in there to try and pick up guys, and that's wrong. So, if you want to save your soul, I will allow you then to go into the church. But you need to go to confession. You need to go to Holy Communion. Okay, and then St. Mary said, all right, and then I'm going to come back right back out and, oh, mother of God, then please tell me what I need to do in order to save my soul or to have my soul saved. Okay, so she went in. I'm assuming this took several hours because she had to go venerate the cross, confession, Holy Communion, probably a lot of time in, in other prayers as well. Came back out and the Virgin said, all right, Mary, go across the Jordan, the River Jordan, go across the Jordan. And that's where you're going to live. And you are going to wrestle with God's help, with your sins and your passions and all of that spiritual dirt. But take courage that if you persevere, God will save you, your soul. And so St. Mary believed her and crossed the river. Not a second thought. No second opinion necessary. She just crossed the river. And she lived there for 47 years years. Yes, 47 years. And for the first, oh, I think it was 17 years, she was tormented by, in her own words, wild beasts day and night. But she didn't mean animals in the desert. She meant her sins and her passions. 
So after she had been in the desert for about 47 years, she met a man named Father Zosima. Now, Father Zosima was an Orthodox priest. He was a monk. He went across the River Jordan, and oh my goodness, there is St. Mary of Egypt, naked, hair crazy, sticking out everywhere. If you ever see an icon of her, I'm going to try to find one to put up. She's one. Of, she kind of looks like St. John the Baptist in icons, you know, very unkempt. Hair is, you know, throwing a disco on top of her head, and she has, you know, ratty clothes, really not, not any clothes at all, except maybe like a wrap or something. And her skin was all brown and leathery. I mean, she was someone who would, she was wizened by 47 years in the desert sun. Okay. So she met Father Zosima, and after he got over his shock at seeing her, he realized, oh, she's beckoning to me. Maybe I should go because she apparently knows my name and knows why I'm here. And she knows that I'm a priest and she knows that I'm a monk. So they walked together and she told him her story. And she begged him to, n number one, pray for her. And number two, on Holy Thursday, she wanted him to come back to this given spot in the desert and give her Holy Communion. Because she said, well, I haven't had Holy Communion since the day I was converted and then I came across the river. So please, Father, you know, Bring me communion next Holy Thursday. And he said, okay. So he did. And when he first arrived at that part of the, the Jordan, he expected to see her in a specific spot, but she wasn't there. And so he was thinking, now, wait a minute. God, what are you doing here, God? You know, can, can you please tell me where to find her? Because I don't want her to think that I forgot or that I don't care, but I don't, I don't see her. And then he did see her. Walking on the water, walking across the River Jordan and saying, Father, I'm here, come over. So shaken to the core by witnessing this miracle, he forded the river, gave her Holy Communion. And she said, please, Father, come back next year at, on the same day. See me again. Because she was staying in the desert. She wasn't going to come with him. And she said, please come see me again in a year. Let's meet at the spot where you first met me. And so he said, okay. So the following Holy Thursday... He returned. And he had also, by the way, in the intervening year, taken to heart the advice she had given him about his monastery. And apparently he was not the abbot, but there were some problems there, I guess, with people not being very devout and some kind of unchristian things that were happening. And so she had said to him, you know, when God tells you it's the time, here's what you need to do to try to get your monastery right. So he comes back next Holy Thursday. And again, he doesn't see her. So he prays to God, and then he looks and he sees her. Dead on the ground. Face pointed toward the east. With, in the dirt around her head, was written, let me see if I could find it here. This is the part that always makes me lose it. Okay. Where is it, Daria? Here it is. Sorry. Traced in the ground by her head, Abba Zosima, bury on this spot the body of humble Mary. Return to dust that which is dust and pray to the Lord for me who departed in the month of Fermutan of Egypt, called April by the Romans, on the first day, on the very night of our Lord's Passion, after having partaken of the Divine Mysteries. So that was the first time that he had ever learned her name also. And what he understood was, last Holy Thursday when he had given her Holy Communion, um, she was 
miraculously transported to this spot where they originally met. Because by her own hand, she had let him know she died on Good Friday. And of course, in the Orthodox tradition, the liturgical day starts at sunset. So that means she had communion on Holy Thursday, but then once the night fell, it was considered Holy Friday. Great Friday. That's the, the day of the crucifixion. So he understood this was a serious, serious miracle that had just happened. Number one. Actually, well, I'll finish the story first. Sorry, I get ahead of myself. I get so excited about this. So, so he's thinking, Lord, must I bury the body of the saint by myself? I'm an old man. I don't have any digging tools. The ground is hard. It's very dry. Help. And then a lion came along. Lions don't normally live by the River Jordan, okay? Comes a lion. And so now Father Zosim is like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm dead. But no, the lion came and licked the saint's feet, Saint Mary. And then it started to dig her grave. And then Zosima came and he had found a, like a broken board or something to use as a shovel. So he and this lion dug the grave together. He buried her body, he prayed over it, of course, and then returned to his monastery. Do you understand? Here is a woman who, in the beginning of her life, I mean, she could not keep her legs closed. Okay, she was unbelievably sinful. She was a hooker because she liked it. And she was so far gone, she was going to go in the church to pick up John's. And in a single instant, when she prayed to be allowed to go in that church for the right reasons, and she prayed that God would, through the Virgin Mary, tell her what to do to receive salvation. And then it was that knowledge was given to her instantly. And then what did she do? She didn't stop there, did she? She followed through on her promise went across the Jordan, gave up everything that she knew, family, friends, uh, physical beauty, clothing, perfume, uh, you know, cooked food, sex, anything, human contact, El Dunzo. Why? Because she, in that moment, you know, God poured out comprehension upon her because he does that the minute you ask sincerely. You are instructed by wisdom. She sincerely repented, and look at this, she's, she was walking on the water like Jesus. Because she had, for so many decades, devoted herself to him through that promise that she had made. She wasn't just giving lip service, she really, she was obviously serious about repentance. And so, despite what she had done, the Lord made her so much like himself. He deified her to such an extent that she walked on water. And then was miraculously transported the next year to where she died. Unbelievable. How do we know all this? Well, because Father Zosima, after he buried her, returned to his monastery, and eventually uh, the life of St. Mary of Egypt was recorded by um, St. Sophronius. So if you Google it, you can read the whole thing. It's, it's, I don't know, it's probably going to take about 20 minutes to read it, but. You know, and so I just pray that we all have the grace and the humility to be able to follow her lead. Maybe we don't need to go live in the desert, but the point is, in a single heartbeat, she gave up all of the crap. Because she understood. Before, was her, before her, God had set life and death. Pick one. If you can't have them both, pick one, and she chose wisely. So, whenever we start to lose hope, whenever we start to feel sorry for ourselves, feel like God will never forgive us because of our sins, remember St. Mary of Egypt. Remember St. Mary of Egypt. She became one of the greatest saints of the church. In a single moment. I gotta go. God bless you.